Okay, well, I'm already up here, so I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, as you've heard, my name is Katie Kemp, and you might know me from such places as The Bulletin, The Children's Area, Serving Communion, sometimes I do some reading, or this might be your first day here, in which case you're meeting me for the first time, so here I am. Um, you also may be wondering what I'm doing up here. Um, well, Pastor Carol asked. <laughs> so I said yes, and um, it actually is a great honor because um, growing up in the church that I did, women would literally never be allowed. And so to be asked and to be given this opportunity is truly a great honor, and I am delighted to be here. Um, now, as you just heard when I talked with the kids, something that I like to do when I read the Bible is kind of try to figure out what God is like. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm just going to talk to you about our readings and kind of tell you what I think it shows us about who God is and what God is like. So we're going to start with Jonah. Um, Jonah is in the middle of a whole bunch of prophets in the Old Testament. And so truly for most of my life I believed this was a true story. But it actually is a fictional story. It's a comedy um, it's actually a satire in which characters are placed in extreme situations, and then using humor and irony, we can critique their stupidity and their bad behavior. Um, so that's what, that's what happens in Jonah. He's real dumb, so we're going to talk about that. Um, he's not a real prophet like Jeremiah or Ezekiel was a real prophet who lived in biblical times. So something you need to know about Jonah right off the bat is that he hates the Ninevites, like deeply to his core, hates these people so very much. And so God says, Jonah, you need to go to Nineveh and give them my message. And he's like, hard pass. I don't want to do that. I would rather do literally anything else. Um, and he gets really, really mad at God for trying to give them this deliverance. And throughout the book of Jonah, Jonah shows us comedically the selfishness and hatred of his enemies as compared with these Ninevites who are supposed to be pagans, they're supposed to be the bad guys, and they are repentant. So the book really just turns everything on its head. Everything is upside down. Uh, the characters in the story are very stereotypical characters, but they do the exact opposite of what we expect them to do. So our prophet, who typically would be expected to be obedient, is rebellious. Um, our sailors, who in biblical times would have been very immoral and interested in some inappropriate things, were very soft and repentant, and they knew they had done something to, to frustrate God to make the waves come up. Um, we have a murderous king who humbles himself before God. Everyone is doing something that is completely unexpected. Um, so before our reading today, you may remember from all of your life, the story of Jonah being swallowed by either a whale or a great fish. Um, he avoids going to Nineveh, he gets swallowed by the fish, and then he kind of says like, sorry God, I'll go do what you want now. Um, and then he finally decides, okay, I will go to Nineveh. So he goes to Nineveh, and he gives what in Hebrew is a five-word sermon. He says in English, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's like, that's nothing. He said nothing, right? He says nothing. What are they, what have they done? What are they supposed to do now that they've been told their city's going to be overthrown? They have, they have no ideas. And I don't know if you noticed, but there's a very important character missing from that sermon. God. He, God is, Jonah doesn't even mention God. It's not even in there. I, you could think potentially, that Jonah is trying to make it really hard for the Ninevites to repent by giving them absolutely no information about what they are supposed to do. It's almost like he wants them to fail, which I think he probably really does. But it doesn't matter because the Ninevites are incredibly repentant. They cover themselves in ashes and they put on sackcloths, and even the cows repent alongside the humans. Everyone in the city is repenting, even though they don't know what they did or how they're supposed to fix it. Um, and, and what's important here, the Hebrew word used for overturned is hapak, and, or for overthrown is hapak. And it can mean overthrown, but it can also mean transformed. And Jonah is really hoping, in this case, that when he tells them that the city is going to be overturned, that it's going to mean 
overthrown. But what he gets instead is an entire giant city full of people who are transformed and who find God's mercy. So Jonah's annoyed, naturally, and he, <laughs> he leaves the city and he goes to pray, saying he knew that God was going to be merciful to those people, and he says, God, please kill me, because I would rather die than live in this city with these people. Um, he goes up onto a hill, and he's pouting, and he asks God to please just kill him, and God asks Jonah, like, is your anger justified? And Jonah is like, yes, of course, please just kill me already, I'm done. God obviously doesn't do that. And God asks if perhaps the people of Nineveh are worth saving. That is the last line in the book of Jonah. That's it. Are these people worth saving? And here's the point. Here's why Jonah is in the Old Testament, why it's one of our prophets. The point, this book is for us. It was written for us to ask questions like, are we okay with God loving our enemies? Are we okay with God offering those people mercy and compassion? So what does this tell us about what God is like? I think it says that God is merciful, that God loves everyone, and that God uses ordinary, crabby, spiteful people to change the world. It's, uh, it uses us. That's what that means. Okay. Um, <laughs> so now we're going to, okay, we're going to transition now. That's the story of Jonah. Now we're going to talk about Mark, okay? So what do we know about Mark? Well, unlike Jonah, which is a fictional story, Mark is a historical representation of the life of Jesus. It was written by a co-worker of Peter's and Paul's, and his name is actually John Mark. Um, and there's a historian that's linked all of the writing in Mark with the eyewitness account of Simon Peter, who is Peter. You, you should all be familiar with Peter, the rock, all those things. Anyway, so Mark almost never tells us what he thinks. The actions in the story are just what Jesus did and how the people at the time reacted to what Jesus did. So there's not a lot of, like, opinions being given. It's just here's what happened. So we pick up the story, and Jesus is going around Galilee, and he's announcing the good news, we call it the gospel, that God's kingdom has come near. Well, what does that mean? These people are all living in Roman occupation. They live in a kingdom, so, and they've been waiting for a new king. Their whole lives they've been told there's a new kingdom coming, and Jesus is here saying the kingdom is near, and that is a reference to the Old Testament scriptures about God's rescue plan for the world, that through Jesus, God is confronting the evil in the world and its hold on people's lives. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus is inviting everyone to live under God's reign by following Jesus, not under Roman occupation. And that is what made people, especially those in power, so afraid during Jesus' life. So our, our reading today uh, is where Jesus walks up. He's on the Sea of Galilee, and he sees these fishermen, and he calls them. He calls Simon, who becomes Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And um, because I like a lot of context, I went to find out what I could about these four guys. So here's what you need to know. Simon is the older brother of Andrew. He was a married guy. He lived in Capernaum, and he is friends with the sons of Zebedee, who are in our story. Um, he could be unsure, and you may remember him from such stories as denying Jesus three times. So this is a man who had doubts and was a little bit sometimes lacking in confidence. Um, he also uh, was irritable, angry, or rash sometimes in his behavior. He has a really forceful personality, but he really really loved Jesus. Andrew, who is Simon's brother, was first a follower of John the Baptist, um, who was making a way for Jesus, and he was not quite as boisterous as his brother. He kind of just went along with it. He was a little bit more of a follower, content to let his big brother take the lead. And then we have James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were in Jesus' innermost circle. Sometimes they were called the sons of thunder because they had a fiery zeal. So this matters because these are just ordinary people living their lives, having different personalities, being doubtful and rash and confused all the time by what Jesus said. And that is important. These people and who they were as people matter to the story. Um, Jesus says, drop your nets and come with me. I will make you fishers of people. And here's what you need to know about fishermen in the times of Jesus. Uh, fishermen in biblical times worked very hard. The Sea of Galilee, it's not a very big sea. It's actually 
quite small, but it is 680 feet below sea level which made it really susceptible to weather changes and things. Storms could come up just like that. We know that from other Bible stories. Um, and oftentimes, the fishermen in the area worked overnight to catch fish because the weather could be better. Most of their time as fishermen was spent repairing nets. Uh, there were like four different kinds of fish in the sea, and they had different nets for different kinds of fish. They would fish in different areas for different kinds of fish. They had a deep knowledge of the sea and the life in it. And they, when they heard Jesus say that they were going to go fish for people, they would have understood that that was going to be really hard work. They were going to be required to push themselves mentally and physically to walk alongside Jesus. And that the way that they fished for people would vary based on who they were talking to. They would have to learn more about these people and build relationships with them before those people might consider following Jesus. So as the disciples went out to make more disciples, they were working on growing the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God was not being built based on where you lived or who your parents were. You, we, were not going to be subjected to a king's rules and power just because of where we were born. So what is the kingdom of God like? Well, you didn't ask me, but I am up here, <laughs> and I have a microphone, so I'm going to tell you what I think the kingdom of God is like. Um, I think the kingdom of God looks like equality. It looks like equality between all people, everyone having the same access to God's love. It looks like good fruit. This is the thing I talk a lot about in my personal life. I think when you are doing the work of Jesus, your life produces the fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So when you are in the kingdom of God, the work you do produces good fruit. And the kingdom of God also looks like awareness of others. It means looking up and looking out. It's not just doing this and thinking about yourself and praying for what you need. It's really paying attention to what's happening in your community and in the world at large. So how do we build the kingdom of God? Who is the kingdom of God for? This brings me back to Jonah. Is the kingdom of God just for some people? Who gets to be redeemed by God? And how do we as followers of Jesus fish for people? Well, here's the good news. Jesus is for everyone. That's, that's it. That's the whole thing. Jesus is for everyone. And I want to make sure you guys understand, this includes our enemies and the people we're not a huge fan of, but it also includes ourselves. We are all worthy of God's redemption, and we are all beloved children of God. So lest you're sitting out there today thinking, this doesn't include me, I want to assure you that it does. Every one of us is worthy and loved by God. When we love and follow Jesus, that will produce good fruit. This looks like caring for your neighbors, patience with people who annoy you, joyfully serving your community. And it looks like love, even when it doesn't make sense. Love for your enemies, love for yourself, and love for the earth and every part of God's good creation. The best way to fish for people is to love them well. And this means being in relationship with them. This is not always easy. It is not always people that you like. And sometimes people will hurt you as they also try to follow Jesus well. When it looks different than the way you do it, it can hurt sometimes. But we still have to do it. Loving people is the thing. And God's love is for everyone. Regardless of whatever changes in their life, we are still called to love everyone the way God loves us. And this is how we see God's kingdom on earth, even in the face of powers and principalities that try to tell us otherwise. So, as you heard this story today, who are your Ninevites? Who do you wish God would smite? You don't have to tell me now, you can tell me later. <laughs> are you fishing for people? Can you easily fish for people you don't know well? I would like to recommend that you pay attention to the people in your orbit. 
and build relationships in your neighborhood, in your workplace, at school, and here at church. But also remember that your orbit is really anyone you encounter. We, every day, have an opportunity to love people well. And that love is the foundation of God's kingdom on earth.